Yes. Well, it's great to be with you this evening. Um, I'm going to get ready to do some screen sharing here because we're going to talk about tomatoes. And it's easier if I can show you pictures as I'm doing that. On this first slide, um, it talks about growing tomatoes, and we have some pretty red ripe tomatoes here. Uh, the first screen showed that we are K-State in an extent research and extension, and that we are partnering with the library. And we it was also showing something from Sedgwick County, because many people don't know that Sedgwick County uh, fun, provides most of the funding for uh, the Sedgwick County programs, and so we are very appreciative of that. The first time I did this presentation was several years ago, and a, a friend mentioned to me, said, you know there's a song about homegrown tomatoes, and I, no, I didn't know that. It was written by Guy Clark and popularized by John Denver. And homegrown tomatoes, homegrown tomatoes. You know, I'm not going to continue to sing it. I won't put you through that. But it's kind of a fun little ditty that says, what would life be without homegrown tomatoes? Only two things that money can't buy, and that's true love and homegrown tomatoes. So I'm going to talk about tomatoes. Now, I realize that many of you watching this are experts at growing tomatoes and have a lot of things that I could learn from you. And if I don't mention your favorite thing about growing tomatoes, of adding a special home uh, recipe, that's probably because um, we present research-based information. They, they, what we provide to you is generally there has a lot of research behind it. What we're seeing on the screen now is this picture jumping around, but I found it kind of interesting because it does show how much bigger tomatoes get. A lot of times you get home from the store with your nice little tomato plant and you find a spot for it and say, oh, that'll be big enough. And come August, that wasn't big enough. You needed a little more space. So uh, just kind of a note on that, but you have to figure out where you are going to grow them. Are you going to put them in garden beds? Are you going to grow them in containers? Or maybe a straw bale. That was really popular several years ago. It would be a little late to, to start doing that this year because this, the straw bale needs conditioning before it would be a good place to grow a tomato. But you can grow a tomato in lots of places. One thing we won't show you is growing a tomato upside down, as was also popular several years ago, because it turned out that didn't work out really well. But when you're deciding where to plant your tomato, you need to think about what tomatoes need. First of all, they need light. They need, you know, a lot of light. In Kansas, we have a lot of full sun, so it won't say they need daylight all day but they need a good six to eight hours, at least half a day of sunlight for tomatoes to grow to well, and they, they don't mind the heat. Another thing they need are nutrients. So it's a matter of what kind of nutrients on your soil. There's a lot of things that they need and a lot of things that they don't need so much of. Um, and then the other thing they need is water. So that's one thing for you to consider. Can you get water to your plants easily. The easier it is for you to get water to your plants, the more likely you will be um, watering them as often as they need to be watered. Uh, natural rainfall isn't gonna do the job. It doesn't in a good year, and when, since we're in a drought, it definitely is something that we have to uh, supplement. But then you're thinking, what kind of tomato should I plant? You know. Somebody tell me what kind of plant. Well, that depends on you. Do you want for slicing to put on a, a nice bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwich? Or do you want to make tomato sauce? Or are you going to make salsa? Or, you know, what is your what what are your preferences? Nobody can answer that for you for sure. But there's there's cherry tomatoes, or there's red, orange, purple, and yellow tomatoes. It's, people swear by them that they have better flavor than the ones that we've grown our whole lives. So that's a question that's out entirely up to you. But the kind of tomato you should plant is the kind that you like to eat, use, or give away because they don't keep a long time. There are two main kinds of tomatoes that you can grow. One kind is indeterminate, and that means it keeps growing all summer until something happens to kill it. 
it's going to keep growing. And so those are generally going to turn out to be bigger plants. So if you're going to grow an indeterminate kind, um, it's uh, you're going to need a, a bigger cage. You're going to need a bigger place to grow it. The determinate kind means it only it grows for a determined amount of time. And that generally means it's going to have a lot of tomatoes all at once, which is great if you're going to be um, canning them or freezing them or somehow or other uh, finding a way to process them to keep them to enjoy through the year. And then you still, we're still figuring out what kind of plant because you can, in the indeterminate and the determinate, there are still different kinds. You need to think about disease resistance. Um, one thing we often see on a plant label is VFFNT. Well, what does that mean? Well, it's talking about what kinds of diseases or problems is this plant going to be resistant to? The V is for verticillium wilt. There's two kinds of fusarium wilt, and that's the two Fs. Nematodes are a little critter that lives in the soil and messes with the roots, and so that's what the N is for. And T is, means it's resistant to tobacco mosaic virus. There are a lot of, there are other kinds of viruses, but that's one that you can find plants that are resistant to. You need to think about crop rotation. You, Move, that means move your tomatoes around every year. Um, they, a, a good practice is to rotate every four years between your, your tomatoes and plants in the same family, which are peppers, eggplants, to, uh, potatoes. They're all the same family. So you don't want to grow those things in the same place where you have grown tomatoes. And so you want to grow them in another area then you've grown and, and maybe put beans or carrots or something else that you like to grow where you've had the tomatoes in previous years. And that is because the plants in that family all are likely to be affected by the same kinds of diseases. And once that gets in the soil in an area, it might not bother, but just a little bit this year, but next year it will bother more because it had something to eat and grow on and, and be, um, a little stronger. And so the longer you grow your plants in one location, the more prevalent the disease will be in that area if it's going to be a problem. So that's what you want to think about. When you're choosing your types, do you want a hybrid tomato or a heritage? I think my slides got a little bit out of order. The hybrids are generally the kind that have the disease resistance. And um, that's very helpful. If you have a, an area that is prone to plant diseases, have, growing something that's resistant is gonna give you a better chance for success. By the same token, the heritage or heirloom or open pollinated varieties that we're familiar with, some people swear and say they have so much better flavor. I'll take my chances with the disease. I'll, I'll do other things to prevent the disease, but I want the kind that I like. And as you can see in the picture, they are all kinds of colors besides red, including red, you know, so there's a lot of options there. When do you plant? Now I understand this is not a 2017 calendar or not a not this year's calendar, it's from 2017, but I have an area circled on there that uh, shows you that our average frost-free date is generally in mid-April. And that is great. It's, it's good to know when that is because tomatoes are very susceptible to a frost. If there's a frost, they're, they're gonna be damaged, probably killed. And so you definitely don't want to plant before the last frost. But the thing is, that is an average frost-free date. It could still freeze, even though we are at that date now, we could still have a freeze. Sometimes it freezes into April. So uh, that's something to consider. And there, a lot of people say they never plant until May 1st. And a lot, it's not just because there's they want it to be sure and not frost, but because the tomatoes are not going to thrive until the soil temperature is warm. We want it to be 50, 60 degrees soil temperature for the, the tomatoes to be really happy. 
we could probably put him in the ground right now. And I know some people have, but until the temperature of the soil warms up, they're not going to be really happy and do really well. So they're, there's not a lot of point in planting them early if they're just going to sit there. They could, they could sit in some place a little warmer and maybe do a little better. When we, it is time to put your tomatoes out, you decide, okay, I'm going to put them out next week. Well, you want to take them outside somewhere near the place that they're going to be growing. That will give them a chance to, to harden off. You know, I'm, I'm thinking about my husband. You know, It's been a long, cold winter, and he was just really looking for some warmth. And he went out last week and said, came back in, he said, oh, it's hot out there. Well, it was only 80 degrees. Now, in August, he's not going to think 80 degrees is hot but he does now because he's accustomed to cooler temperatures. Well, the tomatoes are kind of the same way. When we've been growing them in our sunroom or our, under our grow lights or so forth, they have perfect conditions. And in order for them to get a little tougher to be able to live out in the real world where they're going to be, we need to give them a chance to get a little tougher before we put them through the trauma of yanking them out of their pots and sticking them in the soil, that's a different temperature than they're accustomed to. And just, it's kind of stressful. So the more we can do to get them accustomed to the stressful growing conditions before potting them, probably the better they're going to like it. There's such a thing as leggy tomatoes. And that means I've got some at home. I've been started my uh, tomatoes about uh, four weeks ago under the grow lights, but the grow lights are not as strong as sunlight. And so they grow kind of a little too tall for the size of the plant. They, that means that the stem is too long. It's a, they're leggy. And so what you can do if you have tomatoes that have an extra long stem is you can bury them deeper, kind of make a little trench or something to lay part of that stem in up to the leaves because roots will grow out of the stem uh, and, and it, your plant will have more roots if you do that. Now, that being said, don't necessarily go out and buy plants that have extra long stems that are leggy so you can do this because it still does take some energy from the plant to grow the new roots. So they're not necessarily gonna be that much better off if you do that. In your watering, have a good water source. Um, we've had a couple of instances where somebody called and said, my tomatoes are not doing well. What, I don't know what the problem is. And we'll come to find out their well water that they were using had, had a little bit of salt in it. It was, it was a high concentration of salt. Well, not many things are going to like to grow in um, water that's salty. That uh, So that's something, know that you're uh, source of water is good. When you plant the tomatoes, you do water them immediately after planting. They are going to want to have good, gives good uh, contact with between the soil and the roots. In general, uh, after you, when you're watering your tomatoes, you want to water in the morning. Um, they've just, they've gone all night without a new drink of water and that watering in the morning will help them get through the day. You do want to water deeply and infrequently. And so that means if, you're, if your soil is wet, if you put your finger in the soil about an inch or two down and it's, and it's still moist, you probably don't need to water. Um, we do need uh, to have air in the soil as well as the water. And so we don't want to water too often. When we water deeply, that means we have water farther down in the area where the uh, tomato roots are going to be. And watering deeply and infrequently encourages the, the uh, tomatoes to grow deeper roots down to where the water supply is. So, but when it dries out, then of course you do water again and it might be twice a week. And when it's really hot and dry, it might be every day. It depends on your soil. Somebody always asks, well, how often should I water? There isn't a pat answer. It depends on your soil. If your soil is sandy and the water drains quickly, you might need to water more frequently than you will if you have more clay soil or, you know, if you're growing in a container, you will have, you will be, you'll have different 
uh, conditions there. So you just have to see how your soil is doing. Drip irrigation is the preferred uh, way to uh, water your tomatoes, most vegetables, but tomatoes, um, if you water from overhead, often that means there's splash back up off of the soil onto the plant, and that's how some diseases are transmitted. So if we can water uh, with drip irrigation or the picture there shows a, a soda bottle, turned upside down. They've, they've poked holes in the lid in order to let some water. And so that lets you, the, puts the water down in the root zone and you don't have the splashing water. Now, I have had people tell me when I said that, said, you don't know what you're talking about. It, the leaves get wet when it rains, you know? Well, that's true. But in the conditions where we have a wet rainy spring and it rains more frequently and there is splashing of the leaves, are also times that we do have more soil-borne diseases problems on the tomatoes. So the way you water is something you can control. And so preferably water with drip irrigation or, or some way that keeps the water down on the soil and not on the plant. This picture shows a picture of what we call physiological leaf roll. And that tomato, you can see the tomato leaves are all curled up. They're just like, what is the matter that do they, have they been sprayed with an herbicide or something? Well, this is when you have young tomatoes that you have just put into the garden. They have been in good growing conditions in the greenhouse or in, in your uh, protected area. And now they're in their garden bed. And when it, the uh, weather is cool and nice, they don't have to grow a whole lot of roots because they're living in perfect conditions. But when the temperature heats up and it's a little more stressful, often they don't have the root system developed yet that will transmit enough water to the leaves to, for them to grow comfortably. So what they do in the meantime is they curl up their leaves like this to uh, preserve the water that they have so that they can continue growing. And in you know, a week or two, they'll, the leaves will look normal because it will have developed more roots to be able to take up more uh, water to meet its needs. Tomatoes do need to be supported. Um, here we've got a couple of examples of uh, ways to grow tomatoes uh, to get them to grow upward. The picture on the right is staking, where you can just grow one tomato plant up one stake and attach it to the stake. You can plant your tomatoes closer together that way, but you're going to prune off any of the suckers that start. Uh, so you, um, you, don't, you will just have one stem or possibly two. You can uh, let maybe one sucker at the bottom grow and then tr train both of those stems up your stake. And then the picture on the right shows one. I've got a little different picture of that on the next slide. The top is showing the stake and weave system where you put down a row of stakes with tomatoes planted in between them. And then you use twine or string, something to weave past the stakes back and forth around, you know, past the tomatoes and another stake and past a tomato and back. And you do that when they're small. And then as the tomatoes grow, you keep weaving it back and forth to support the stake, the tomato all the way up on the stakes. Um, one thing you do need to do, as I said, you'll need to prune out the suckers. The bottom picture shows where a sucker will grow on a tomato plant where it's got a, a leaf coming out. You'll get this little growth uh, that's coming out right between the, the main stem and your leaf growth. Well, you just pinch that out before it gets very long. And so you just have one or two stems that you're growing up the stake. Another option is to cage your tomatoes. We've got a picture of a couple of different kinds of cages there. The one looks like it's made with uh, uh, concrete reinforcing wire mesh. Uh, that's a good way to make a tomato cage. And one hint, if you're making your own tomato cages with this or out of um, four by four fence wire, you can make them different sizes. Like if you make one 15 inches and another one 20 inches, um, 
then when you store them in the winter, one will fit inside the other and they take up less storage space. So that's something to think, think about. The picture in the middle just kind of shows a cage that you can buy at the hardware store. Those generally work pretty well if you're growing a smaller size tomato, one of the determinate kinds probably, but I have not found those to be big enough to um, manage the massive amount of growth that you're going to get on an indeterminate type tomato because they can grow six feet tall. Um, and then the picture on that's made of the, uh, the wood there, you can make those whatever size you need to for the plants that you're growing. That's the benefit of that. Some, depending on how you make them, they, they may take a lot of storage space or they may be able you know, to uh, store pretty easily, but that's, that's some, another possibility for you. Um, but I, I use, have used the four by four, four inch by four inch mesh fencing, hog wire they sometimes call it, to make cages for our tomatoes. And I have found that I also, I put, generally put one stake and a, a tomato cage on each side of it to keep the Kansas wind from coming along and blowing the tomatoes over. Because the fencing is only about four and a half feet tall. And sometimes the tomatoes by the end of July are six feet tall and they're reaching out the top and leaning over. And so they need some extra support to keep them from falling over. Tomatoes do benefit from mulch. Uh, Mulch, you know, you can see some straw mulch there. Sometimes plastic mulch is used. Those are, are both fine. Sometimes the, the plastic mulch down at, earlier in the season will help warm the soil. Um, but mulch conserves water. It stabilizes the soil moisture, which is very important. Um, sometimes if you have a problem with tomatoes cracking, it's because the soil got dry and then it was more wet and the tomatoes grew more and it caused the tomatoes to crack. So consistent soil moisture is important. The mulch keeps the soil cool, which keeps the tomatoes happy and it reduces weeds. You know, someone, when I've talked to them about that, they see the picture of the straw mulch and they say, Oh, that's a terrible thing to do because then you have the wheat seeds. Well, it depends on your mulch. Generally, the, the wheat has been thrashed out, but if it hasn't all been thrashed out, you will have the wheat seeds that will grow. And, and so you'll have that to deal with as well. But some kind of mulch is very important and is really a good plan for beneficial growth. So I think this would be a good time for us to stop and, and see if there are any questions at this point in the program. Hi, Donna. It looks like we've had a couple of questions. Um, the first question that I see is, how big of a container do you need? As large as you can manage, because uh, it depends on the size of tomato. If you're going to grow one, try to find one that has a label that says that it's recommended for containers, because a really big plant in a medium-sized container is still going to struggle. You want to give your tomato plant as much room for the roots to grow as you can manage. So, you know, um, a minimum, would, I would think, would be like a five-gallon bucket and preferred, preferably larger. The, the smaller the container, the more frequently you're going to have to water. Okay, so the other question that we received is, is wood mulch you get from the store fine or do you recommend straw or something else? Well, um, I like to use straw or something like that. Frequently, sometimes, you know, if I have an area that the weeds have gotten away from me and they're, they're you know, a couple of feet fall, tall and I have to do a lot of weeding and pull up the weeds, I will then use those for mulch. You know, just any, any, the wood mulch would work fine, but, um, you know, it's still going to be there at the end of the season. Whereas if, when you're using something like straw or uh, a smaller plant material like that, it will, it will be pretty well used up and gone by the end of the season. So you won't have to figure out what to do with it. Okay. And those are the two questions that we've received so far. Okay. Very good. Well, we'll go ahead and talk about what can go wrong? So 
one Donna, thing. Yes. I'm so sorry to interrupt. We just had two more that came in really, really quick. <laughs> okay. Um, what are the best companion plants? Um, one thing that I really like is nematodes because there's pretty there's been enough research to show that uh, if you plant if you have a problem with nematodes, plant marigolds with your tomatoes because the roots of the marigolds deter the nematodes. They they don't it makes it an area they they don't want to grow in so much. So maybe they'll go somewhere else. Um, other than that, um, there are a lot of ideas of things to grow with tomatoes. But I haven't seen enough research yet that we can really recommend say, well, grow basil or grow this. Um, you can talk to somebody who's had good experience with something and, and give it a try. But uh, for me, gardening is pretty much an experiment anyway. So I like to use the research-based um, information as much as I can. And the only one I'm, I'm sure of is the marigolds are a good companion plant. Okay. So another question um, that came in is, what about fabric barriers? Um, that it, in general, I don't like to use fabric barriers because I have found that oftentimes the, um, weeds will go ahead and, you know, you'll get a little dirt on top of the soil. The weeds will go ahead and grow. And, and then you have to worry about getting your fabric barrier up later. Um, you, it would work. Um, and as one thing to consider the fabric barrier will let the moisture through where if you're using plastic mulch, you would probably want to use that over a drip irrigation system to be able to, to get the moisture to your plants because plastic, of course, will repel the moisture. So uh, those are some things to consider. Okay, and so one other did come in, but it may be what you're getting ready to discuss. Um, what is the best natural way to prevent pests? You know, <laughs> it depends on the pest, and I we don't have that much time, <laughs> so uh, um, I do appreciate that. Uh, some what one thing that I'm going to try this year is planting um, some nasturtiums uh, in the area where I have my tomatoes, and the idea of the nasturtiums is to provide a lure that maybe they'll like the nasturtiums better than they like the tomatoes. Um, if your pests are birds, well, we'll get, we'll get into that in a little bit. I'll go ahead and we'll talk about what can go wrong. Absolutely, thank you. Uh-huh, thank you. So, believe it or not, being too nice to your tomatoes is not a good thing to, to your plants, it's not a good thing to get them to set fruit. Um, nitrogen in particular, uh, generally you want to use about half the amount of nitrogen when you're growing tomatoes as you would for another crop. Um, they, they do want nice fertile soil, but a lot of nitrogen is going to encourage them to grow a great big plant. It grows lots of foliage, but it doesn't bloom. I said sometimes you have to kind of think like a tomato. And a tomato is looking at its lifespan. If everything is wonderful, it sees no reason to produce seeds because that's what the fruit does. It's, it's a way for the plant to reproduce itself. And it's only when it's stressed that it says, oh, I better put on some fruit and make some seeds so there can be more tomatoes in the future. So yeah, if you, use, if you have a high nitrogen content, um, that will uh, often make big plants without a lot of tomatoes. Um, I talked to someone just this week who said last year they put in raised beds and put in a nice rich raised bed soil, but the tomatoes grew really big plants and not a lot of tomatoes. Well, there could have been another reason for not having tomatoes, but it also could have been the really rich uh, raised bed soil they used. And maybe it will be better this year because there will be less nitrogen available. Another reason for their not having any fruit set is because it's too hot, particularly at night. If the nighttime temperatures remain around 90 degrees or more, the they're just the the blossoms won't 
um, take the pollen, they just won't set fruit. Same thing as if it's too cool, if it's below 60 degrees, the, you don't have good fruit set. So those are a couple of things that, you know, last year, I think that was very few people told me they had a good tomato crop. And a lot of that was because um, it was so hot in the evenings at, and at night. Um, I have found that there are different varieties that respond differently. One year it was hot at night and our slicing tomatoes didn't do well, but our um, sauce tomatoes, our uh, Roma types, still produced fruit. And so we wound up slicing them and putting those on our BLTs. So um, that's, that's another thing to consider is, you know, different, if you grow more than one variety, maybe one will do better than another. Uh, okay, you've gotten your tomatoes, you go out there and you see this beautiful red tomato on your vine and you grab it and the bottom side looks like this. It's nasty. Oh my gosh, that's disgusting. Well, it is caused by a calcium deficiency, but putting more calcium in the soil won't help. I, they, there are a lot of products out there that you can buy that says, this is gonna solve your problem, spray this on your tomato plant to set, solve the calcium deficiency. But actually it's more of your plant is not mature enough yet. The early tomatoes are generally the ones that have more of this problem because generally our, our soils have enough calcium in them. Um, but the roots of the plant early in the season are not developed enough to be able to transfer the calcium that is in the soil up to where it's needed in the plant. So generally, you don't need to do any treatment other than picking and disposing of the affected fruit and the fruit that comes on in a week or two will be okay. So that's, that's the good news is the problem will solve itself. The bad news is there's really not a lot you can do to avoid it. Okay, you go out and you have beautiful tomatoes, but they're cracked and have all kinds of strange growth in them. Well, some tomatoes are just like that. Uh, a lot of the heirloom types in particular that I've seen just do have a lot of different, um, you know, it's like they've grown a couple of tomatoes together. They're, so you just cut out the part that is, doesn't look good and is kind of coarse and, and eat the rest of the tomato. But I'll go back to the consistent watering as far as the cracking is, goes. If you can manage to keep your soil evenly moist, and that so that's the drip irrigation, mulching, um, that will help with the cracking more than anything. Now, some varieties, they just crack. The skin is tough and, and that's what it's gonna do. But other varieties only do it when um, there is inconsistent water. So that's the main thing you can do for that. Okay, it's harvest time. You've gotten there. You've gotten through all the struggles of growing the tomatoes and you look out and you've got these perfect fruits and you're ready to pick them. So how do you know when to pick? Well, one is you look at it. You know, if it's still a solid green, well, it could be a variety that stays green or it could be that it's, it's just not ready yet. So when they start changing color, depending on what color your tomato is going to be, you go by the appearance. If it's uh, generally a red tomato and it's, it's turning red, that's great. One caveat on that is if the temperatures are really hot, they won't get full color hanging on the vine. So if they start to turn red, you can go ahead and pick them, put them on your countertop and let them ripen inside. They will turn the shade of red if it's a red type that you're looking for and um, they will go ahead and ripen on the counter. They don't have to still be on the vine. Another way to tell if they're ripe is by how they feel. You know, when the tomatoes are green, go out and feel them, get to know what they feel like. They're still pretty hard. But when they get closer to being ripe, you'll find there's a difference in the way they feel. They're, they're still firm, but they're not as hard. There's a little, little more give when you're trying to tell with if they're ready to pick. Another is, do they feel heavy when you grab a hold of them and lift support them in your hand? So that's another indication of a nice 
juicy, ripe tomato. So you, you pick them, you figured out they're ripe, you pick them and you bring them inside. Well, what do you do with them? Um, you can refrigerate them. This says avoid refrigeration if possible because it does affect the flavor. They are never going to taste better than when you pick them straight off the vine and bring them in and enjoy them. But if you've got a lot of them and you're not gonna be able to use them, then of course you put them in the refrigerator. Maybe when you're going to eat them, take them out a little while before you're going to slice and eat them because they, they might taste a little better. When you store them, you do want to store them in a single layer. If you stack them, you know, put a lot of them in a basket, they're probably the weight of one will bruise the ones below it and so forth. So um, in a single layer is going to be best. And you might try storing them stem side down. If you notice the way the tomatoes ripen when they're on the vine, the shoulders next to the stem are always the last to ripen. So if you put them stem side down, that will help them ripen more evenly. But the main thing you want to do is eat them or process them or give them away soon. Uh, the sooner you deal with them, the better they're going to be. And enjoy your tomatoes. So uh, some other things I wanted to tell you about what we do at Extension. This number right here is our Sedgwick County Extension Master Gardener hotline. We have Extension volunteers who answer the hotline. I believe it's nine to noon and one to four most days, you know, weekdays. And then there, there is our the email address that you can uh, send your questions to. And those are great resources. If you have a question about your tomatoes, Probably other people do too, and you can call the hotline and they say, this is my problem. You say, this is my problem. What can I do about it? And they say, everybody's having that problem and, and they will guide you on what you can do and what isn't going to help. So, or maybe there isn't anything you can do and you just need to know it. So that's our uh, good thing, good resource for you. And then I wanted to let you know about other program areas we have at the Sedgwick County uh, Extension Office. We have our gardening, aging and Medicare, food and nutrition, 4-H program, agriculture, a lot of good things go on here at the Extension Center. And so you are invited to participate in those. And so are there any questions? There are not any that are currently posted, but let's give them a minute to see if they have sure, any. Sure, sure. And while they do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and post the link to the survey. Um, so it's actually in the chat. And I did, um, a question did come through. Can you have a soil sample tested at the extension office? Yes, you can. Um, you can uh, call the hotline number I gave you or any of, you just call the extension office and our receptionist can tell you exactly what you need to do, how to take your soil sample and where to bring it and what the cost is. I, I do recommend soil samples just as a base to, for you to know exactly what's going on with your soil. I, I will share with you the other, um, I mentioned in there the uh, using a bale as a way to grow um, tomatoes that was, the straw bale was very popular. Well, my husband and I tried that at home, except we used a uh, Milo bale uh, and Phil put it in a nice cage and we, it was big and we, we put a lot of tomatoes around and they just looked awful. And we figured out, oh, that bale we use probably was from Milo that had a herbicide sprayed on it. And so that was not a good place to grow tomatoes. So that's something you need to consider. If you're using mulch, don't use mulch that has maybe grass clippings that have been sprayed. Um, that's, that's something to be careful of. Okay, and we've had several um, questions come in. Is it okay to freeze tomatoes or is it better to can them? Basically, it's your preference. Freezing works just fine. 
Um, whether you can them or freeze them, their um, consistency is going to change. They're not going to be like fresh tomatoes, but the flavor will still be there. So either one will work just fine. One thing I would like to uh, mention, uh, some people I, I found some people didn't know that if you dip your tomatoes, you're going to process your tomatoes either way, and you dip them in boiling water for 20 to 30 seconds and pull them out, the skin will slip right off. And so that's a lot easier than peeling them by hand. That's very good information, thank you. Do you recommend putting foil or paper around the stem and plant? Um, it it kind of depends on whether you think you have cutworms. Um, you, can, you can do that, it's not going to hurt anything, but it's not necessarily going to help. Unless you're putting out your plants and you, th you think you may have cutworms in your soil that may, putting a barrier around your stem of your plant may help keep the uh, cutworms from cutting your plant off and ruining it. Okay. Is it a good idea to plant marigolds with tomatoes in a container or will the tomatoes be good alone? It, well, generally, if you are putting a potting mix in your soil, it's not going to have uh, uh, nematodes in it. So the to, uh, marigolds wouldn't be necessary. So it it's, wouldn't be as beneficial, but it's when you're planting them in the soil in the ground that you're gonna probably want to have some marigolds that will help with an, any nematodes you might have. Okay. Um... One person indicated, I've had problems with spider mites and with fungus. And then they did spray, question mark. I can't tell the difference. Okay, well, spider mites, if you, if you think it might be spider mites, you take a blank sheet of white paper out and hold it under an affected branch and tap on the branch. And when you do that, if you, then pull the paper out and look at it, it will look like you sprinkled pepper on your paper. And then if you look at it, those little dots of pepper will start moving around. Those are spider mites. This could be the exception to not getting uh, water on your foliage because one of the best ways to deal with spider mites is a strong blast of cold water. You take your garden hose out and you have a sprayer on it and you spray it underneath the leaves, on top of the leaves, everywhere. And that generally does a really good job on spider mites. If it's fungus, that's going to be the wrong thing to do. And then you're going to want to use a fun fungicide. Okay. Do tomatoes prefer acidic soil? Slightly acidic. They really prefer between 6.4 and 6.8, but that's almost neutral. So slightly acidic is fine, but the, they don't mind our soil that is, you know, just a little bit alkaline either. What varieties do well in Kansas? Roma, slicers, cherry, grape? Actually, there are ones of all kinds that do well in Kansas. And one of the, uh, along with this, this uh, video is, there was a publication that Tracy made available. And I highly recommend that you get that publication it is about six years old. So it, it lists several varieties of tomatoes. There are a lot of varieties that have made, been ava made available since then. So, and you may not be able to find those varieties locally, but um, you can find all different kinds. Um, there is a variety that will do well in Kansas. Okay. If the tomato plant grows higher than the cage, should you cut off the top or let it flop back towards the ground? That's personal preference. Uh, I, I am kind of a lazy gardener. And so I tend to just, as long as it's not uh, hurting anything or falling in a, in a direction that I don't want it to, I just let it grow. But it wouldn't hurt to cut it off because that's just going to encourage your, your plant to be bushier. Okay. Is there a chart for which preservation methods work best with certain vegetables? I think there probably is, and you can contact the office and they, they can, that would be part of our foods department that would have that information, but our receptionist can certainly point you to what you need. 
Okay. Should you dispose of mulch from the previous growing season? Um, it would probably be good to compost. We do encourage people to compost and compost is a wonderful additive when you're setting up your beds in the following year. And uh, we also have publications on how to do that well. Does shade cloth have any use during the season? If, um, yes and no. I, I know a lot of commercial growers that are growing in a high tunnel or a greenhouse do put shade cloth over the top of their uh, building just to try to reduce the temperature uh, in their high tunnel or, or greenhouse. Um, if you have a situation that you can use shade cloth easily, that would be fine. Um, <clears throat> in my particular instance, we have a few trees growing around the bed, our, our garden, and so our, our tomatoes do get afternoon shade. And along with that, I wanted to mention uh, one of the problems that we have, it, somebody mentioned pests, is tomato hornworms. And you know when you've had a tomato hornworm, it just totally eats all the foliage off your plant. I don't have a problem with tomato hornworms because we have trees growing around the outside of our garden bed and the birds take care of them. I can go to my plant and I say, oh, I had a tomato hornworm, but it's gone. The birds got it. So uh, where you locate your garden, that's, that could be a consideration as well. Okay. Would weighted newspaper be okay as a mulch? Yes, that would be a good mulch. Or cardboard. Uh, if, you, if you get a lot of things from Amazon and you have a lot of cardboard boxes, that is good mulch material as well. And this next one, I'm going to answer. Um, it says, can we watch the recording of this program later on? And the answer is yes. Um, the library will actually post this recording on our YouTube channel. It takes a little bit before we get to it. We do have the first gardening one already posted. So hopefully um, by this time next week, we'll definitely have Donna's. And then I do have another question for you, Donna. Um, can you put coffee grounds around them? Yes, you can. And it doesn't hurt anything, it, um, but um, what has been learned about coffee grounds is unless you're putting the coffee out of the can before you brew it, there's not that much acid left in the grounds to do much. A lot of times people are thinking they're going to acidify the soil by putting the coffee grounds around. And it, it's great, um, it's, it's good mulch, it's good compost, uh, but... Uh, it doesn't have much acidity to it anymore, but yeah, you can go, you can do that. Definitely. Okay. So there aren't any other questions that have been posted. Let's give it one minute, just in case there's anything that comes to mind. Right. And while we're doing that, I will let everyone know. I had posted a link in the chat to the survey, but then there were so many fabulous questions that I thought it might get lost. So I posted another link to the survey and another question came in. Okay, can you prevent tomato worms? Um, I don't know that you can prevent them. Um, the tomato hornworms that we commonly see are, uh, I believe they're a larvae of a sphinx moth, something like that. And so uh, they're, just like other caterpillars, their, their eggs are gonna be laid and then the, the caterpillar will hatch out of the egg and be there. Um, but uh, they're easy to pick off. And like I say, if you've got birds or birdhouses around, sometimes they will help you with that problem. Okay, have you tried growing tomatoes hydroponically? Actually, I have one. Uh, I did one last year as a kind of an experiment in the winter, um, and I have one growing at our house now, and um, I don't know how it's going to go. I know there have been people who have had a lot of success with it. Uh, our tomatoes last year, we got a couple that I was growing inside, but it wasn't a huge success, but I'm trying it again. Okay. Using cardboard, do I need to chop it up or can I lay down large sheets? It works down well to lay down large sheets of cardboard. You know, just cut it to the size you need and uh, lay it down on top of the soil. It works great. 
Okay. We may be building raised boxes for our tomatoes. Any certain wood better than the other types for this? No, I don't think so. Uh, you always want to be can think about, okay, what kind of treatment or other use, you know, if you're using used wood, what has it been used for? But uh, as far as a, whether ash is better than pine, I don't know. Okay. If you grow in pots, is it okay to use that same soil the following year? Uh, <clears throat> generally, I will uh, try to, I'm, I might use it, but I will mix it half and half with some fresh soil. The, the, a lot of the nutrients in the soil will be used up the first year and it will have compacted and so forth. So freshening it up at least, if you're not going to start with all new soil, would be a good idea. Okay, and I think that that was actually the last question. Um, so Donna, I want to thank you for your outstanding um, presentation. It was incredibly informative and I really appreciate all of the um, detailed answers that you provided to um, the participants' questions. You did a fabulous job, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so before we conclude tonight's program, just a reminder, we would absolutely love it if you would go ahead and fill out the survey that I provided two times in the chat and is also in the Zoom link that I sent out. We'd love to hear how you, um, what you thought of this evening's program and then also um, any additional programs you would like to see. We are offering additional programs as you saw in the slideshow, but you'd also see on our website if you went to wichitalibrary.org events. And we just wanna, Thank you again for your support of the Wichita Public Library and thank Donna for her absolutely wonderful and incredibly informative program. And this ends this evening's program. Thank you very much, Donna. And thank you, everybody.